most treasured guitar, which is this 1967 Fender Telecaster, serial number 197557, uh, which I bought in 1976. And uh, it's uh, what's known as a transition telly, in that it's post CBS, but it still has a lot of components which were pre-CBS. Leo Fender never threw anything away, he used whatever he got. And um, I think when CBS took over in 1965, I believe that's right, um, the guitar, the instruments from then till about 67 or late 67 are known as transition tellies. And I'm going to get a little bit nerdy here, so apologies for that. But the logo here is the, is the classic transition gold-coloured Fender logo, um, as opposed to the previous one, which is called the Spaghetti logo. It's slightly it's different. And the ones after this were similar to this, but, but in black and not gold. I'll show a close-up of that in, in due course. So, this guitar is known as the Plank. It has been for 30-odd for years. And the reason for that is that my very first rehearsal with Feel Goods in 1989, April, about this time of year, in fact, um, I drove down to Canvey Island, uh, set up, we played a couple of songs, and Lee Brillo turned around to me and said, I like that guitar, it's just a plank, isn't it? And that was it, the name stuck, it's been called that ever since. So that's why it's the plank. Um, I bought it uh, from an ad in the back of Melody Maker. In, in those days, in the 70s, if you wanted to buy used musical equipment, that was one of the best places to look. Um, and that's where, that's where I found an ad for this. Um, it was in, advertised in Hinckley in Leicestershire, which is not a million miles away from here. And uh, I called the guy and he, he said, I'll, I'll bring it to you tomorrow, the next day. Now, at that time, I wasn't a pro musician, I was, would you believe, a civil servant. I worked in an office, at a government office, um, but I'd saved every penny I could for some time because I really wanted a Fender guitar, and a Fender Telecaster in particular. And the reason I wanted a Fender Telecaster was down to Francis Rossi, because I'd been to see Status Quo at Coventry Theatre, and I think it was 1972. I was still at school then, um, and it was, I was just taken with the sound of the Telecaster. I, I, I thought, that's, I really would like one of those guitars. So it took me some time to save the money, but it, eventually I'd saved about 200 quid in a piggy bank. And um, yeah, the guy brought it over, and he, my two... Back, we had a band at the time called Hands Off, so the drummer Andy Bentley and Dave Reeves were there to witness the, this guitar arriving. Um, Ruth was there, obviously. Um, my wife, that is. So he brought the guitar in, opened the case, and cliche, it was love at first sight, it really was. I just loved that guitar as soon as I saw it, I wanted it badly. Um, even more so when I actually got to play it for the first time. Now, I'd never, I'd never had a, a, a proper guitar before. The guitar I had been using, doing gigs with, was called a Top Twenty. In fact, I've still got it. Um, it was the kind of the guitar that you could buy from catalogues, um, but I actually bought it from a guy, uh, my, a guy at school, Colin Bicknell, who was in another local band. And he was upgrading to a Hofner Galaxy and he was selling his top 20, so I bought it for 14 quid. And uh, I think the body of that guitar was actually plywood, but I mean, it's quite a clunky to play, but you know, I did gigs with it. So there you go. But anyway, now I got a Fender. Oh, I was so over the moon. You, I can't tell you how over the moon I was. I put it on a stand and I just 
stared at it for hours that, 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 that night. I couldn't believe I'd actually, actually got a real fender. And here it is, I've still got it. All those years later, although I didn't, I was that close to losing it. I'll tell you more about that in a little while. Um, it's had, to put it mildly, an interesting life. It's not had an easy life. Uh, in, in the 1980s I played in, in a band called the DTs and uh, one night we were playing at JB's in Dudley, the legendary JB's and I, I have no idea why but in a moment of madness at the end of one song when we were playing a gig I threw it across the stage why did I do that? Ruth was in the audience, she was fairly upset, shall we say. And uh, what it did to the guitar was break the headstock there. I'm going to bring the guitar to the camera so you, hopefully you'll be able to see that. I'm all tangled up. So just trying to get the light on it right across there cracked all the way through and there's the fender transition logo there in all its glory so uh, I've broken it idiot 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 anyway we got it home and the next day I made some special clamping calls and I got some really good wood glue and I glued it up, clamped it up, left it for 24 hours and it's worked, it's absolutely fine, it's been like that since that day, since well, whatever, 1985 I think it was, something like that it's absolutely fine and it's, you know, it, 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 it withstands the tension of the strings, no problem then <laughs> On December the 28th, 1996, it was a cold winter's night, and we were playing at Chiddingfold Village Hall in Surrey. I'd driven down there in the car with, with the plank with me, and um, in its brand new leather bag, which I'd just had it imported from California. Beautiful leather bag, right, made by Reunion Blues. Um, anyway, we'd done a sound check, and it was pretty cold in the venue as well as being cold outside. And there was a pub down the road, so we all decided to go down to the pub for an hour. And rather than go in the band bus, which was parked in a good parking space for the load in and load out, I said, don't move that, let's go in my car. Now, I had a child seat in the back of the car at the time, and I had to move that. And whilst I did that, I lent the guitar in its bag on the front wing, like that, of the car. As you say, that's the car. <sighs> Moved the child seat, everybody got in the car, I forgot about the guitar, I forgot the guitar was there. So I reversed the car, the guitar went over like that, and then forward, boom, boom, and as soon as I, that happened, I thought, I've just run over my own guitar, and sure enough I had, and it broke the neck again. This one's a bit harder to see, so I'm not going to bring it to the camera, but it, it's the, I can see it's a crack across there. It didn't break it completely off. It, it just snapped it and it sort of was hanging off at a bit of an angle like that. All these top frets popped out. Um, but the same thing. Fortunately, I had another guitar so I could get through the gig. I had a spare one. But I took it home again and exactly the same again. I glued it back together, clamped it up. And once again, it's absolutely fine. It plays as good as it ever did. <laughs> but there you go. Um, uh, right, and then fast forward in Saturday the 10th of May 2008. The previous night, on the Friday of that week, we played one of the Lee Brillo memorials on Canby Island. And the following day we had a gig, I think it was the, at the Astoria in London, Astoria 2 maybe. Anyway, um, my friend Pekka from Finland and Gabby from Germany 
wanted to go to the gig, so I said, yeah, no problem, come with me in my car, I'll drive you there. So we did. Um, we got there early um, and we had, we had some time to kill, so I invited Gabby and Pekka to come with me to Tower Bridge to see, go, you know, do a little guided tour of Tower Bridge. So I found a multi-storey car park manned, this was broad daylight, middle of the day, uh, parked the car, and then Gabby had her suitcase in the front with her, so I said, no, don't leave it there, it's, vis it's visible. So I opened the boot of the car, where the plank was in its leather bag, and um, my own suitcase, put Gabby's suitcase in there, shut the, the, shut the boot of the car. I looked over by the lift and there was a guy watching. Now he had on, well he, he appeared to have on, one of these lanyards, so I, I thought he was an employee of the car park. Never thought more of it. Anyway, we went to Tower Bridge and came back. We'd been gone less than an hour. When we got back to the car, the window had been smashed in. And uh, I, f I thought the worst. Open the boot, there was nothing in there. And I thought, oh. Desperate desperate sense of loss, but hang on a minute, and I looked over the car park and blow me, there was, the, there was the guitar, the bag, the leather bag, and I, I thought, oh well, whoever's stolen it has taken the guitar and left the bag, so I ran over to it, but no, it was in there. What I think had happened is that he, and it was, I found out later it was a he, he'd broken in, um, the alarm would have gone off, the car alarm would have gone off, which would have alerted the security guy downstairs, and I think he was just after money. So I think he ditched the guitar and took off with the suitcases. Wrong choice, because the guitar was worth more than the car. Anyway, I can't tell you how re the relief that I'd still got it. And, and by the way, had we not come back at that point, anybody else could have come along, found the guitar in the middle of the car park and, and, and took it. How lucky was I? Someone up there was looking down on me that day, for sure. Um, we phoned the police, who were amazing by the way, and, and they arrived within minutes and the, one, one of the the officers, a police, a police lady, she found the suitcases two levels up, um, just been ransacked, but of course there was no money in there, it was just clothes and, you know, things that we needed for travel things. However, on the car, on the handle of the car, there was blood, the thief's blood. So, DNA, we got the guy's DNA. Um, and the only thing that was missing was one of my shirts, and I reckon that he cut himself breaking into the car and probably used a shirt to wrap around his hand or something like that, and that's why the shirt was missing. Um, and then the, the police um, repaired the window for me temporarily so I could get home that day, that night after the gig. So we went off to do the gig and played the gig. Six weeks later, I had a phone call from the police to say, they, got the, they knew who the guy was, they got his DNA, and he was a known drug, drug addict. So he obviously was just looking for money. Whether it was the guy by the lift that I'd seen, I don't know, I really don't know, and I never will. But anyway, I got it back, that was the, that was the main thing, and oh, I, I have nightmares about it even now, losing this guitar, because it's so, it's part of our family, you know, frankly. Anyway. We got it back, did the gig, and uh, yeah, still got it. By the way, I'm gonna name, I'm gonna drop some names shamelessly now, because not only have I played this, uh, Peter Green's played it, Alvin Lee's played it, Joe Strummer has played it and wanted to buy it. We, we, we did a festival in France, um, and Joe Strummer's then band, the Mescaleros, were on, and he came into our dressing room to say hello. He saw me sitting with the guitar, and he just went, oh, "Can I have a go?" And I said, "Yeah, go for it." 
and he, and he said, oh man, I love this, how much do you want for it? I said, not for sale, sorry Joe. Um, yeah, so there you go. Steve Marriott's played it as well. Um, it's been refretted 